We welcome once again to Wednesday Noonday Bible Class uh, at Community Baptist Church in San Rosa, California. Our pastor is a Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner. My name is Brother Jim Kennedy, and Sister Marie Dreyer is the one that types these lessons so he can follow along. So we thank her for that and for her ministry. Uh, we got a good lesson. Uh, it's sure of your relationship. And uh, we'll start off with scripture and prayer. We have some praise reports. We pray that uh, Larry Newsom is uh, uh, sickness with in remission of his cancer. Uh, we thank you for answer prayer. We thank you, Lord, Lord, for answering his prayer. And uh, we thank you for his remission of his uh, illness, Lord. Uh, and we pray for. Lord, we want to pray for a sick and shut in in the Community Baptist Church, uh, Frederick Brady, Patricia Jones, uh, Margaret Michaels, Roderick Walker, Anthony Hopkins, Anita Marie Johnson, Vincent Harper, Joseph Hampton, Elois uh, Oliver, Larry Newsom, uh, Dean Beckman, Brian Gordon, George Payton, Henry Jones, Lonnie Harrison, Rick Guy Santry, uh, Marion Nelson, Beverly Combs, uh, Sister Rucker, and Sharon Rockstead. We also lift up our pastor, uh, Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner, for wisdom, healing, and protection. We pray for CBC staff, Maria Dreyer, and her family and uh, my family, uh, Jim Kennedy and his family. We pray for the ministers, uh, Reverend Parker and uh, Reverend Francis, and uh, we pray that there will be done, uh, that you will be done in their lives, that they be uh, bring glory and honor to you. Uh, we pray for auxiliaries, ministries, teachers, and church family. We pray for the Hampton family at the loss of their niece due to COVID. Uh, we pray for Deacon Barnum Duncan and family for healing and strength. We pray for Brother Michael Peterson for healing. We pray for the Swanson family for healing from COVID. We pray for a massive historic flood in New York due to Hurricane Ida and also in Louisiana. We pray for situations in Afghanistan for hope, healing, safety, and protection. And uh, we pray for those that uh, are battling through the affliction with wildfire through California. For those who are some of the prayer requests, we pray for all those out there are listening. Lord, you know their needs and wants. We pray that for them. And uh, we'll start with the scripture. We'll read uh, Psalms 100. It says, and I'm reading from the uh, New King James. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God, and he is he who has made us is not, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. May a blessing be to the hearing and reading of Psalms 100. Let's bow on our uh, word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, thanking you for once again that we can study your word, Lord. We ask, uh, Lord, that the Holy Spirit minister to our hearts today through this lesson, Lord, that we can be assured of our relationship with you, Lord that we know without a doubt that, that we can't be persuaded that uh, you will never leave us or forsake us, Lord, that we know you are there. Once saved, Lord, that you are always with us, Lord. So we thank you for that. We thank you for your Lord just being God and watching over us all through the day and night, Lord. And Lord, we ask us to give us ears to hear and eyes to see your ways today as we journey through this day uh, that was not a uh, promise to us, but that you give it to us and woke us up and start us on the way, Lord. So we pray for this lesson, Lord, that you that we will glean things that you want us to know and that we will bring glory and honor you as we uh, obey and, and trust in you uh, this day. 
So we thank you and we praise you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we got a good lesson. And uh, it says, session two, sure of your relationship. And the question, who do you know? Uh, who do you know that almost always uh, uh, ex exudes confidence? Uh, the point, my relationship with God is reflected in how I live. The passage is 1 John 2, 3 through 11 and 15 through 17. The Bible meets life. Life has a way of surprising us and throwing us into a sea of unknowns. We saw this in early 2020 when the virus from the other side of the globe came crashing down on us. One day, parents were dropping their kids off at school. The next day, the school was closed indefinitely. One day, people had steady, stable jobs. The next day, many businesses had to shut their doors indefinitely. For many, not a working meant not getting paid. Even worse, many lost their jobs permanently. One day, people were free to move about, but suddenly they were uh, cautioned to stay in for fear of catching and spreading the COVID-19 virus. When life is full of unknowns, confidence and assurance can disappear. In their place comes fear and doubt. If, uh, we all need confidence and assurance. Amen? And when it comes uh, to living the uh, Christian life, confidence and assurance become critical. David Allen said, trying to live the Christian life without e uh, either is uh, like driving a car with the brakes on. This passage shows us we can take our foot off the brake. Okay. Uh, my relationship with God is reflected on how I live. That's the point. First John 2, 3 to 6. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keep not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby knows uh, known we that we are of him. He that, uh, he that says he abides in him uh, himself also to walk even as he walked. Key word abides, verse 6. This refers to remaining in God or Christ uh, and reveals a permanent relationship. We cannot claim to abide in Christ unless, unless we live like him. Amen? The short order of these passages, John used the word no four times. John wrote that Christians can know for certainty they are in a relationship with God. Assurance of salvation is based on the right condition. Living in Oklahoma, we often heard that weather conditions are right for a tornado. The right condition for a tornado results from the instability of the atmosphere. When warm human condition in the lower atmosphere make contact with cooler conditions in the upper atmosphere, an intense spin occurs that subsequently produce a tornado. The right condition for a Christian to have the assurance of his or her relationship with God results from walking in obedience to God's command. We don't obey out of legalism, but out of gratitude for all God has given us, especially the gift of his son. Obedience happens as we keep his word. This phrase stressed the importance of consistent, continual compliance with the word of God. We still will follow, uh, follow on occasion, but all true Christians seek to live their lives in obedience to God's command. Amen. Obedience is the natural outcome of a new birth. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 50. We demonstrate our love for Jesus through our obedience. Therefore, if we lack assurance and salvation, all we need to do is to look at the pattern of obedience in our life. Obedience to God commands doesn't say, 
Obedience to God's command doesn't save us. We are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ, the one who kept the law perfectly. Get that in. Obedience to God's command doesn't save us. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, the one who kept the law perfectly. Now we obey because we have the relationship. Our obedience reflects our relationship with Christ. Amen. However, for those who don't obey, John has some harsh words. He, he that said, I know him and keep not his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him. It's like the guy who claimed to be a football player but never showed up to practice or for the game. He claims it's not backed by his reality. Unfortunately, this is the same for many so called Christians today. They profess Christ with it. They, they, they profess Christ without any life change whatsoever. Is the real Christianity? Absolutely not. No Christians obey perfectly, but every genuine believe, believer has a desire to obey God. And that desire is sustained, sustained by practice. The proof of our love for God is our loyalty and obedience to him. True love for God is reflected through gracious obedience to his command. Throughout John's writing, he reminds us of the call to love others. John 11, 34, 35, and 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at 1 John 4, 7 through 11. 1 John, no, 1 John, Four, seven through eleven. Says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loveth uh, not knows not God, for God is love. Is that uh, in this was manifest the love of God toward us, because the God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Therefore, there herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a perpetuation for our sins. We love it if God so loved us, we ought to love one another, amen? So let's put this together. God loves us, we love him in return, 419. And we show that love by obeying his commandments to love one another. God love has worked on us and in us in this way. Is the love God perfect meaning? Uh, this is love is perfected meaning. It is maturing and pointing to our conversation and transformation. Why do, you, why do you find challenging? What do you find challenging about walking in God's footsteps? Uh, I would put, you know, challenging is because uh, you always, you're always going to have that nature uh, fight, you know, that uh, your human nature, and uh, so you always got that challenge where you got to uh, put God first in your life and and. Uh, follow his commands you know but we do sin and we do fall short and sometimes we have to confess as soon as uh, we know our sins and confess them that we get back on the right road uh right way with god you know and that's through jesus and it says uh, if you desire to obey the word out of gratitude for all christ has done for you if you see the desire produce an overall pattern of obedience then you have no reason to doubt your salvation, amen? Your relationship with God is reflected on how you live. Uh, so you walk, you know, you talk and you walk kind of match, in other words. So, uh, you know, you can say one thing and you walk a different way, it, it just uh, you, you're not a witness. That's a bad witness for the, the Lord, you know? So, uh, and it's also a bad, a bad way to, uh, being part of your life and all this, uh, as you learn the love for God, you love when you love somebody, you treat them 
the way you would be treated or you, or you treat them even special than that, you know? Okay, first uh, John 2, 7, 11. Brethren, I write no new commandments unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandments and the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment. I write unto you which things is true in him and you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. He that says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Um, Love, loveth repeatedly showed up in 1 John and appears 24 times in 105 verses that makes up this letter. In this passage, John wrote of love as both an old and new commandment. Love is an old commandment in that it mentions in the Old Testament in Leviticus 9, 17, 18 and Deuteronomy 6, 5. The fact Jesus said so entirely of the law could be summed up in this commandment. Thou should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and those shall love their neighbors as thyself. That's Matthew 22, 37, 40. So in what sense is the old commandment also new? We see the newness of this old commandment and how Christ perfected, obey, and manifest it. Up to the, that point, no one has demonstrated love perfectly on earth. Jesus fully and perfectly demonstrated agape love like no one before him had ever, ever had. He shows us what obedience to the commands look like. Jesus told his disciples, a new command I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you and that you also love one another. By this shall men know that you are my disciples and if you love one another, uh, love one to another. John 13, 34 and 35. Shortly before he spoke in these words, Jesus had even given them example of love by washing their feet. Love humbly serves others no matter how significant the task. Amen. Love is the highest virtue a person can express. Another uh, can express toward another. It is an attribute of God revealed when he gave his son to die on the cross. Through the definition of agape love, found in 1 Corinthians 13, we realize love is the bond that unites the church, amen? Love is the ingredient that uh, propels mission, and it is the fuel that ignites revival. When God's children choose to love, they walk in the light and the darkness flee, amen? For this reason, John wrote again a new commandment, I write unto you which things is true, in him and in you. Because the darkness has passed, the true light now shines. He that says he is in the light hates his brother is in darkness even until now. The light John refers to is God's kingdom, which was inaugurated at Christ's first coming. The true light now shines at Jesus, the light of the world, 8-12. And his disciple and his kingdom is characterized by both light of love. Our love for God and for others is proof we are citizens of the heavenly kingdom. The light of Christ is here, but the darkness is not fully eradicated. Yet, I recently watched an epistle of painting with Bob Ross on TV. In this particular program, Ross started with a dark canvas. He began adding touch of yellow, oranges, red, and creating light for the painting. Soon the light began to overtake the darkness of the canvas. By the time he finished, the darkness didn't didn't look so dark anymore. Christ is victorious. Christians are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. And as uh, citizens of Christ's kingdom of light, we push back the darkness when we walk in love. 
Right? But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not whether he's good, where he goes. I mean, he wants and he don't know where he goes because the darkness had blinded his eye. Loving as Christian love don't come easy. Love can be costly. The love of good, uh, the good, the love of the good Samaritan cost him. Luke ten thirty to thirty six. God's love for us led him to a costly sacrifice of His Son. But when we sacrificially, we are reflecting the love of God, and we are reflecting the right re relationship with God. Of course, there will be times when we don't uh, love as we should, but the Christian life is characterized by light, not darkness, love, not hate. How would you describe spiritual blindness? Uh, spiritual blindness is uh, people that love the world more than uh, uh, the, the spirit, their action, the attitude, they're opposed to things of God. Uh, so I would say that uh, they're not interested in God's word. They're not, they don't want to learn about God. They don't profess God as their Lord and Savior. They're just uh, spiritual blind. They don't, they're just more of the world. In other words, they, uh, not spiritual by nature, by a nature of the level of self and in the world. Uh, 1 John 2, 15 and 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God, God abides forever. Amen. There's your answer right there. In the previous section, John taught us the critical importance of loving our brothers and sisters, but there is a limit in what we are to love. We are to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. When John used the uh, word world, he was not referring to the people or the inhabitants of this planet. They would be a glaring contrast to what he wrote in this gospel for God so loved the world, John 2.16. Nor was John using the world uh, referring to creation. It would be a contradiction to love God if we hated what he created. Instead, God was talking about the organized evil system of darkness of, uh, that encompass this world. This sin-filled worldly mindset is manifest in those actions and attitudes that oppose the things of God. Amen. The world's temptation can be grouped into three categories, the lust of the flesh. This is a desire for uh, selfish pleasure, selfish uh, pleasures, the person who cares more about himself than others. Most of the time, this particular temptation manifests itself in self-centeredness and narcissism. The lust of the eye. This type of temptation is tied to greed, longing for gain, always wanting more, but never satisfied. This particular temptation usually reveals itself through converting and feeding our physical desires. The person, the person who gives into the sin and always wanting to upgrade the new car and the bigger house. The pride of life. This temptation refers to envy and the love of popularity, recognition, and applause. People fail, uh, people uh, falling captive to temptation and held captive by shows of materialism. Folks ca uh, caught in their sin love to brag. They are show offs who like to put their possession on the play for others to see. Satan and the world are good at marketing these sins to us. This is nothing new. Even the first sin committed included those worldly attitudes. And when a woman saw the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Genesis 3 3. 
what are some things in the world we are tempted to love? We all kind of love our cell phones, we love our money, and so many things is to be uh, things that you love. You know, uh, anything, I would say, anything you put before God. Uh, the world appears to have many greatest need, including the needs to belong and the need to have meaning. But it's tempted us to meet these needs in wrong ways. It is utter foolishness to fall in love with the things of the world, no matter how appearing they may appear. Why? Because the world passes away in the lust thereof. The way of the world are worthless and heartbreaks. It comes and it ends. So true. The great news is that he that does the will of God abides uh, forever. God provides us so much more than what the world offers its last. Only God can give meaning, hope, and comfort through life's trials and tribulation. Jesus invites us to seek first the kingdom of God and the righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6.33. I'd like to read this. Only God can give meaning, hope, and comfort through life trials and tribulations. Amen. The person who seeks the things of God rather than the things of the world is someone who is preparing for eternity. And you can be assured that life lets your life reflect your relationship with God. And they have uh, question five, how can the group help one another overcome the ways of the world in our lives? And we got engaged. And um, we choose one of the following image that represents the opportunity for you to live obedience this week and then ask God for strength and help. Serving, praying, studying the word of God, and you know, what the other one is, I guess, uh, being a witness. Okay, live, live it out. My relation with God is reflected on how I live. Choose one of the following applications. Examine your life. Consider the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Let's look at that. Galatians. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. No part of it, but I don't know. Okay, 5, 22 says, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temptation, against such there is no law. If after examining your life you feel as though you have fallen short in manifesting a true Christian character, then repent and trust in God now. Right? Align your life. Perhaps through this study, you have been assured of your relationship with God. However, you also realize there are four th few things in your life that needs to be realigned under God's will. If so, begin making those changes this week. And three, make a difference to someone else's uh, someone else's life. Be intentionally this week to share about our relationship with Christ. Look for opportunities to serve someone, and when you see it, don't hesitate. Serving others and give a great opportunity for sharing the gospel. Okay, that's a lesson. Uh, now we have uh, a little introduction. Introduction to John. So we're going to get your Bibles out because we're going to read some scripture. Uh, and uh, so I want you to follow along. Um, and if you got it before I start, uh, turn to First John two nineteen. First, First John two, and then we we'll read some scripture from there. But I want to start off. Okay, introducing the First John. It says, among the last of the letters of the New Testament, 1 John was written by John the Apostle in his old age. Strong tradition has it that after Jesus' crucifixion, John stayed in Jerusalem until Mary, the mother of Jesus, died. Then when he went to Ephesus, where he ministered until he was banished 
in Patmos at Ephesus sometime between 800 or 80 and 100. He wrote his gospel, the last of the four to be written. A decade or more later, he wrote the letters we call First John. That the letters follow the gospel and not the other way around. It's obvious to most scholars, apparently enough time has passed since the writing of the gospel for it to be calculated, studied, interpreted, and misinterpreted on the basis of the misinterpretation for the schism that have occurred in the churches reading the gospel. John wrote his epistles to address this schism. See especially, okay, so 1 John 2, 19 says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. And then uh, 2.21, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. And then 24, and it says, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If thou which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you uh, also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And then uh, 26, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. Uh, 26. Okay, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And then 1 John 5, 13. Okay. 1 John 5, 13 says, uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Amen. So this is written. Amen. That you may be sure. Okay. Thus we should call First John a pastoral letters written to the circuit of house house churches in and around Ephesus to counter this split. John had no intention of getting the two groups back together. Rather, he wanted to expose the air and make clear that those who separated, uh, uh, separated really did not belong to 19. And he wanted them to strengthen the faithful in the face of those who were preventing the truth in 226. Uh, let me see what it's... Mm, 226, let me see if it's... These things that are written? Okay, now we read that one. So who were their false teachers and how were they preventing John's gospel? From John's characterization, of them, we can know that they were in error both doctrinally and ethnicity. Examine those two errors will give a, a window into the life situation of the churches as well as into the basic teaching of the letter. In terms of doctrine, the background for First John is the high. Christological of the four gospels. The letter obviously presupposed the gospel, which makes clear that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah sent from God. Indeed, the whole purpose of the gospel was to bring people to faith in Jesus the Messiah, John 20 and 31. So let's look at that. That's John. Twenty. 
34 and, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. Uh, and his, his disciples, which are not written in this book, 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believe it, you might have life to his name. Amen. When John said that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, he was summing up the Christian lodge that began in the prologue with the words, become flesh and dwell among us in 1 John 1.14. Jesus was God in the flesh, incarnated the high Christology uh, Christ is reflected in the way John spoke of Jesus. Jesus was the pre-incarnated word of God. Amen. John 1.1. 1, 1. He was, he and the Father were one in 14.9. No one has power to take his life. Whatever happened was because he willed it. And, and that's John 10 and 18. Even his death was a glorification. Upon reading the gospel, some were uh, in armor with it, a high view of the divine Christian that they doubt or denied that he was really human. The theological of First John is best understood as they respond to this overemphasis on high Christological. Uh, in the letter of John said that those who deny Jesus in the, is the Christ are not so much denying that, that there is a Messiah, but that Jesus of Nazareth who came in the flesh would also be the Messiah of God, 432. Such belief for John was really Antichrist. Uh, such belief for John was really Antichrist. Let's look at uh, let me see, two, I wonder if that's, let me look at it now. 218, first John, I think it's. Okay, it says 218 and 23, little children, it is the last, it is the last time, and as you heard, the Antichrist shall come. Not even, even now are they many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out. Um, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. But you have the unction from the Holy One that you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is at Christ and denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father, but he that acknowledged the Son has the Father. Amen. And then for, for uh, 1 John 4, 1 and 3, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And, and every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is a spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, that it even now already is in the world. Okay. Can we further identify these? Um, Heretics. They were apparently Gnostic, uh, probably Docentic, and perhaps following of the Sir Anthras. I don't know how to pronounce that, but, but what does these terms mean? Gnostic, among other things, had a dualistic worldview. Spirit, thus God, is good, but the physical, thus humanity, is evil. 
when this could not speak dualism, there develops a dialectic from the Greek word dokinen to see. The Gnostic claim that Jesus only seemed to experience humanness for the Messiah of God will certainly never have it for that, which is by definition evil. Ignatius and Antioch were the first to use the word seems in describing their theology. Writing to the Italians, he said, be deaf, therefore, whenever anyone speaks to you apart from Jesus Christ, who really was born, who both ate and drank, who really was a prospective under, uh, prosecuted under Pontius Pilate, who really was crucified and died, who really was risen from the dead. Uh, Sinner is an agnostic who assure, assumed their distinction between spirit and flesh and thus made a distinction proof between the divine Christ and the human Jesus. Centurus asserts that the Christ spirit came on Jesus' flesh at his baptism, this performer, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased and left him just before the crucifixion, thus the former, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? While it may be too much to say with certainty that John was addressing the Cetics, the Gnostic followers of Centuries, there, there is a kind of heresy he attacked. The second era, first John confronted with ethical. When the uh, heretics rejected Jesus' humanity, they likewise pre, uh, dispreciated the life that he lived. This lower Christianity issued a lower morality, and since the evil body was for them only an envelope for the spirit within, nothing the body might do could affect the spirit. So the matter of right and wrong was a non-issue. John was refuting the system as though they lacked moral earnestness. Their new theology produced a new moral morality that was in fact immorality. This, uh, this theocentric Christology produced a group of uh, Gnostic Gnostics uh, and Christians who were all too ready to say, I know him. Before and with that knowledge, he came to be above sin. And that's in First John 1 8 10. Let's look at that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And 10. We say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All the time that their lives demonstrate that they did not know him, their spiritual uh, uh, elitism, coupled with their attitude towards sin, resulted in a loss of love for the brother. Look at uh, 2, First John 2, Brother, I write to you a new commandment unto you, but the old commandment which you have from the beginning, the old commandment in the world which you have heard from the beginning. Uh, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which of things is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light is now shining. He that says he has the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. And it says, uh, and he that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no occasion for stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Okay, let's look at 3, First John 3, 10 to 3, 18.
In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth nor his brother loves not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if you if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren, and he that loves his brother abides in death. Abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and he knows that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And then uh, here, hereby perceive we the love of God because we lay down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever, but whosoever, but whoso has this world good and sees his brother having need and shuts up his bowels, bowels of compassion from him, now dwells the love, how dwells the love of God in him. And then first John four seven. Four seven to five three. Okay. We love it. Let us love one another for the love of God and every one of the love is born of God and knows God. He that loves not, uh, he that loves not knows not God for God is love. And this was manifest the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Therefore, that herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sin. Um, beloved, if God so love us, we ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby knoweth we that we dwell in him and he in us. Because he has given us his spirit, and he, we have seen and does testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he, he in God. And we have known and believed the love of, that God has uh, to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, all, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He has feared is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. The man says, I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar, for he has loved not his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loves God loves his brother also. And two, five, three. And whoever believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God and, and everyone that loves him, that begot love him, begot love of him. Also this is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Amen. Clearly they did not know him, for they did not keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but disobey his commandments is a liar. That's twofold. John then sums up the commandments, and this is the commandment that we should believe in the name of this Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as commanded us in 323. Ethics for John, ethics for John was primarily a matter of love, going out of God's saving love for us, and that's in 4, 10, 11. The gospel commands love one another, John 13, 34. It was repeated five times in 1 John 3, 11, 23, 4, 7, 11, and 12. In his attempt to correct these heresies, John set forth a series of tests for offended 
Christianity. These tests can be grouped that in at least 25 ways. They are embedded throughout 105 verses. Their intent was to test and bring assurance to the true Christian. Two literary formulas were used to introduce the test. Condition and sentence, for example, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. First uh, uh, John 8 and first 5, 10, 2, 3, 4, uh, 12, and 5, 2. And uh, uh, relative uh, causes, for example, he who says, I know him, but disobey his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So we would need to see. Uh, 2, 4, 23, 3, 8, 10 to 17, 4, 6 to 8, 15 to 16, 20, and 5, 1, 4, 10 to 12. A closer look at these passages shows the two primary tests of authenticity are believing that Jesus is the incarnated Son of God who love one another at least 11 have to do with believing in Jesus and at least 15 with loving and hating a brother. One should also consider the vocabulary of First John. Three words have a special pro uh, prominence. Love, know, and abide. Love as a noun, verb, and objects occur 52 times. Know occurs a total of 40 times. Since the word gnostic comes from the Greek word for knowledge, John may well have emphasized this word with a pointing finger. While this telling those who claim to know but do not, it gave full assurance that one can know. Such was, in fact, the purpose of this letter. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. That's uh, 5.13. Abide appears 25 times in the 100th verse, perhaps serve as a dominant, dominant a metaphor for the letter. It was used for both major themes of the letter, Doctrine 415 and Ethics 3, 6, and 9, and 24. Perhaps echoing chapter 15, of John the uh, Gospel, the abide metaphor is a letter with his favorite term of a believer's life in Christ. First John 3, 23 and 24 summarize the letter well with its stress on believers in loving and its metaphor on mature abiding the believer in Christ. Uh, and that's what first John. Uh, which are 3, 20, 23 and 24. This command that we should believe on the name of the Son of uh, Son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. 24, he that keeps his commandment dwells in him and he in him, and hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given to us. Amen. Well, that was the lesson and the introduction of John. First John, uh, well, you can go over and read those scriptures. Read a couple times, but it is, I kind of stumbled sometimes in there, but uh, sometimes you have to read it two or three times, catch the meaning what he's trying to tell you. So uh, go over it again, this lesson's good, and always go over these lessons a couple times. You glean from every time you go over so Let's bow in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you for salvation in Christ. We thank you for dying on the cross, Lord, for our sins. We thank you for the resurrection, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit. You said you would never leave us here for sake. You gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us in our way. We ask that the Spirit direct us throughout this day. We thank you for the praise reports of uh, uh, and all the prayer answers, Lord. We thank you for salvation, and we thank you just for uh, Christ fellowship and Christian fellowship, Lord. We thank you that uh, studying your word just uh, uh, brings joy and, and, and hope uh, in our lives, Lord, as we go through different trials and tribulations, Lord. We, 
we know that God is with us and we know that he uh, will bring us through, Lord, that we are uh, victors in Christ. And uh, we thank you for salvation and we thank you for just uh, loving us, loving the brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we praise you and pray for, for Sister Dolores and her family and uh, Alan Snyder and his uh, grace report that he uh, sees that his addiction, that this way of life is much better than nobody is uh, went through Lord and that he is enjoying life now and seeing the benefits of uh, being sober. So we thank you for answer prayer and, uh, and that and um, we just pray for our church family and all those out there watching Lord. We pray that you, you will be done and that uh, and keep on praying and asking God to uh, answer your prayers and uh, he will and, and his proper timing. So we pray this all in Jesus name. Amen. Have a blessed day, and uh, we'll see you next Wednesday. If God says so. God says so.